Hi, everybody. Welcome for this new Jenkins infrastructure meeting. So today we are six, and that's awesome. Um, hi, everybody. So the first thing that I want to announce here before we start the meeting, we have a new player in the game. So Hervé just joined CloudBees, uh, the community team at CloudBees to work um, with us on the Jenkins project. And he will start helping us on the infrastructure. But yeah, don't, don't overwhelm him with stuff. Um, just one thing at a time. So at the, at the moment, he's still learning and following us. Um, to the topic, we have quite a few topics to the agenda. So the first one, which I misunderstood um, the results, the JIRA maintenance uh, was not enough to fix the root cause of that maintenance. So Unicode does not work in, um, in Jira at this stage. So I have to do a follow up there. Um, so yeah, I, I need to contact Anton to see what, what would be the next steps there. Um, just the next, just yep. for the joke, you I have to remind you that GitHub supports emoji in the issues. Just saying. <laughs> we, we, we are not we're not trying. I mean, I don't think that would be a killer feature to switch from Jira to GitHub issue. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, anyway, um, so that, that's that's something that we have to figure out next week. Um, the next topic is about Jenkins car security update. So we, we had a security, we had a security release on Wednesday for the weekly and for the stable. Um, it was not really smooth because of different reasons. So um, Daniel was not available to help us on Wednesday. So we had to do the, the security release with Batek. Um, and so it was not up to date with his uh, working environment. And at the same time, we discovered many issues that was not that were not related to, to Batek in there. Um, one of them was, so Jenkins issues with package of Jenkins IO. So that 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 was what's the first one. That was an interesting one. We struggled to to allow Padek to connect on package of Jenkins IO. Um, Mark could not connect on package of Jenkins IO neither. Um, so basically, all the people that were added to package of Jenkins IO manually after we stopped the puppet agent, those installations were broken. So we found, we found the issue, we fixed that. Um, the second issue that affected was the update center job, which is a requirement to do a release, um, whatever the, the type, but it's a requirement to do a release, was broken because we, we could, the Jenkins agent could not find um, the, the Java path. So that issue was related to some work done by Damien. Um, so Damien was able to, to identify the root cause um, there as well. So that's something that, so we, we know that we rely on a Jenkins instance named Trusted CI, which is not defined as code, which means that when we do an improvement on one machine, that improvement does not affect Trusted CI. Mm. And it sounds- That's wrong, sorry to cut. Uh, trusted is now managed, and the reason is because I pushed a change that was aimed at fixing issues that appeared a few days ago, but that change uh, was worse than the thing he tried to, okay. to fix. Okay. Otherwise, I should not have pushed a change a day of a release, so I uh, half culprit there. But yeah, we have, co we have configuration as code, and we have synchronization now, so if we if we push uh, something not working, it won't work anywhere. Thanks to so, yeah, but we still have some improvement to do there because many many of the jobs are still many, many maintained manually and stuff like that. So we are just at the beginning of the story of configuring configuring just the CI as code. Um, so that was another issue. I, I I was not able to follow the rest of the release, so, but it appears that it took longer than expected. Um, but yeah, that, that security release was not a smooth ride. Yeah, so Vatek Folonia has been gathering a retrospective document um, okay. and I added a couple of items to it or one item to it related to the weekly release checklist that doesn't exist and that detected some gaps. Uh, we had a formatting error in the change log. We had um, what else? Oh, and didn't get the GitHub version release of the weekly publish. We did publish the GitHub release of the, the LTS, 
so so it just it was it's minor gaps like that and reminder that we need to think about it so oh um, and i can i can put those notes in okay but um do we follow the release i mean we don't when we do a weekly release we don't have a lot of stuff to do we need to publish the github release yeah that's that's the the one thing that's most often missed and i just need to discuss it with tim jacom because there may be an automatic way to make that happen so that we don't okay. don't even have that step okay thanks uh, a um, lot of missing authorization vadek did not have all the authorization on all the repositories right. i had some part and i spent uh, a few hours just waiting in case he had an issue for instance he did not have the right to merge on Jenkins.io or to directly push on the master branch of Jenkins.io. Right. But everything is written on his retrospective, but that's also authorization issues. That mm -hmm. means we can completely improve by having a checklist of check things before, especially uh, can you do, do you have the authorization there or there? Yeah, and there is one other element which was also very annoying. Um, so the thing is, we don't have a very, stable way to disable the weekly release. So I know that Daniel like disabled multiple times the weekly release. And each time we made a change to the duty instance, even minor, um, that's disabling that job was revert. Um, so even several hours before the security release, we had, I mean, even on Tuesday, we had to disable the weekly release because it was re-enabled again. And the problem here is mainly because we configure everything as code, everything is defined in a Git repository, um, it always try to go back to that definition. That means that if we want to, I, I think if we want to disable a weekly release, we'll have to look at it uh, at some point. But we need, we need a way to, to, to easily disable directly. Because yeah, each time we disable the job, it's, it's re-enabled after someone do a modification. So, which is how configuration as code is supposed to work. So, it just reminds us we've got another step. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, any last comment to that topic? No. Okay. Right. So the next one that I want to bring in this case, it's mainly uh, for Damien. Um, so Damien has been working a lot on the AKS cluster. Um, Damien, do you want to? Mm -hmm. So we were eating a limit uh, in terms of number of available IPs because the IP, the subnets are shared between the physical machines, uh, the, the, the workers, the, the virtual machines, the pods and other virtual IPs. So uh, this morning, um, I had to, to do an operation to increase the subnet size to reach the limit we, we were expecting, which means uh, 150 container at the same time, max, which translates to 50 virtual machines up for the cluster. So automatic scaling works as expected. We, the operation is finished. Um, I will go back on that. It took down the AKS cluster during one hour and a half. Uh, and now we hit a new limit, which is the, we hit the rate limit on the Docker Hub. Uh, the reason, and even if we authenticate with the free plan that we have, we will still hit because it's the rate limit per IP. We have a private network of machines. All the requests come from the same public IP from Docker point of view. Can you, um, can you can you not use like multiple IP, a range of IPs for um, egress connection? We could, but we will pay for that. Almost the same cost as paying a full enterprise Docker subscri subscription account. So the uh, I, I would prefer going the direction of having the Docker images pushed on the Docker Hub and somewhere else like an, uh, whatever, because the cost per gigabyte is really almost nothing for a Docker registry. We could use GHC or whatever. So we would have each image on two lo different locations. Um, yeah, so the thing is on most long-term, um, it's more the question of, do we really need that size in auto scaling? Because that costs a lot. We are currently yeah. working on the cost for AWS. Um, because mostly what we stopped paying on the 3,000 
uh, bucks per month that we gain on uh, Azure have moved to uh, Amazon. So the question is more, do we need that much? We know that we can auto scale. So now the next step will be to add more uh, sponsoring capacity. We have DigitalOcean and Scaleway that are waiting for us. Even if it's two nodes cluster, we have the two OSUSL machines that could be revamped uh, as a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, yeah, per, with per, I, I, I would not invest, uh, invest more time in scaling the AWS cluster um, because we don't want to rely on one. Cloud yeah, that, 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 that's the reason. So uh, we have we can have a bunch of tiny clusters instead of one big that scales. Especially we have static machines. Uh, we have sponsorships. The second thing is um, most of the build peaks these days come from specific builds like the BOM. And in the case of the BOM, all the pull requests of the BOM are rebuilt once per week, which means every week during the weekend, we have a peak of 600 uh, builds waiting, and most of the time it's not even needed. So there are also solutions by saying, why don't we just disable the, the weekly rebuild of the pull request and only focus on the master branch? Because one bomb build can be triggered on one time. So these are the next step, um, trying to have different sources for the Docker images to avoid rate limiting, adding more clusters to um, to have uh, different cloud sources for the, the container. So if we bring back a case like I did this morning, we can still handle container workload. And finally, disable builds that are not needed. I propose that we work on these three tasks in the upcoming weeks, and then we do a retrospective in one month to see if we were able to decrease the cost and in, improve the quality of service for that one. Considering that someone can just, uh, from a PR, rerun the checks, um, isn't it just better to stop rebuilding all the time PRs? Because if someone wants to just work on an old PR, you can just ask to rerun the yep. checks. And I'm sure there is an issue from Jesse Glick, which is five years old, about disabling rebuild for pull requests. It might be disabling builds for pull requests at all, which in this case might be a bit too extreme from my point of view, but at least ensuring that the pipeline library and the Jenkins file of the EV builds um, are updated could be a great help to decrease the pressure on CI. Well, and I think we're justified purely from a cost perspective, right? The, the we've got to bring costs down and that's a, an obvious cost that we need to reduce. So then I found it sounds like we have an agreement that uh, we'll try use that, that, that object here. Now, I did have contact with Gradle Enterprise and they have a, a test optimization technique that next week or the following week, I'm gonna explore with them briefly just to see if it could reduce the amount of time we spend running tests on things that are unchanged from one, one delta to the next, from one commit to the next. But I don't know if it will work. Jesse Glick was skeptical. He thought it may not actually help us. Okay, but yeah, it's anyway, it's worthwhile to investigate because it could right. be another improvement on top of the others. Because if we just if you, we already stop rebuilding PR testing PRs that are not which are not updated, um, I mean, that we already reduce a lot of yeah, it, it's still a, a good having both. Please note that the Gradle Enterprise uh, stuff come from the new Gradle server, which is the same idea as the new brand new Maven caching server, as I understood. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time, that part, it's always nice for the developer experience of the machine, but on the CI, it doesn't change a lot because we oh. have uh, big beefy machines and we have a, a, a nice network compared to developers. So most of the time, it's a local caching with a, a daemon running on your developer machine that Gradle or Maven connect to in order to optimize the compilation, which oh. is not what we, we can, it's not easy out of the box because we have ephemeral agents. Right, and, and, and they described that in their DevOps World presentation and said that they had something for it, but I think it's, until we've investigated, I don't know if it will help us at all. Yeah, they, they do have stuff for like yeah, remote build caches and, um, and it's supposed to, and like the daemon will run in CI as well, but yeah, it just doesn't really help with ephemeral. We've always, we disabled the daemon a long time ago at work on CI just because it was crashing and, problems it's probably better now they do say you can have it on but 
even it crashing once or once in every 50 builds is enough that we turned it off um but it's certainly been a lot of work done on it and yeah remote build caches and stuff is supposed to make that easier but is this just for Gradle builds, Gradle builds? No, they, they claimed it was also for Maven builds because I wouldn't be interested if it were just for Gradle. There's just not enough Gradle, Gradle dependency in our, in our infrastructure to, to care. But, but again, it's got to be evaluated. So Tim, you've already got Gradle Enterprise running inside your company, inside your uh, employer? Just, just regular Gradle. Ah, okay. We, we, we use Gradle for everything though. Just Got it. So I may I may beg for your help after I've done some initial experimenting just to understand they they seemed very interested in working with us uh, and getting involved with the Jenkins project. Okay, yep. thanks. Um, next topic is about the recent change. So the Let's Encrypt Root certificate um, changed. Um, so I mean that was not some, nothing new. It just like they totally deprecated the old version. Um, we discovered that it affected us on ldap.jenkins.io, not because, I mean, the certificate that we were using were already signed with a new one. It's just like in the LDAP configuration, we were enforcing the wrong uh, root certificates. So we fixed So, so that, that affected us last weekend. We fixed that uh, Monday morning. Um, so that's one thing. We still have some action to do with the Fastly account because apparently one of the certificates that we are using in Fastly is still signed with the old root certificate. I received the notification by email. So this is something that I have to look uh, there. Um, but otherwise, it did not. I mean, that's the only thing that affected us because we are using it in crypto almost everywhere in our infrastructure. And then. Um, Everything went well. Another funny story was yesterday. So the next topic is about the Rackspace account. So we officially remove all the we officially removed the machine there. Um, so just for the story, we switched from Rackspace to Oracle Cloud um, back in August um, because we could use the new harm machine provided by Oracle. And because we don't pay on Oracle um, the network bandwidth, we were able to reduce the cost from 700 to 25 dollar per month. And so we stopped the Rackspace machine uh, at that time. Oh, no, we stopped. Sorry, we stopped using it, the Rackspace machine at that time. One week ago, we stopped the machine, and so we did not discover any issue. So we decided to delete the machine. And we discovered that we had to follow a security procedure to delete that machine. So we had to call one, one phone number, um, provide our identity. Uh, we weren't then redirected to someone else. I mean, all that to say that that machine is now officially gone. Um, and so KK should stop being built on that account, which is nice for him. Um, question? Yeah, there is no nothing. Um, I see that. Do we have anything? Uh, sorry. Do we have anything left on Rackspace? No, no, no. So run right that Rackspace. That was nice because Rackspace sponsored the Jenkins project for a very long time, because that machine starts I think in two thousand fourteen with Ubuntu uh, twelve. So um, the just the sponsoring ended last year in March, and because that was a very old machine. Um, yeah, that was pretty expensive for us. So now, now we don't have anything uh, on Rackspace anymore, which will simplify the billing. Mm, I thought I thought they renewed the sponsoring or something. Did they did they not end up doing that? They had stopped sponsoring, then renewed us for a period of twelve months, and that renewal ended last March. Yeah, so there was a period where. They had sponsored us for years and years and then dropped the sponsorship. We were surprised after, I think, six or eight months, we asked for, Olivier asked for it, and they granted another sponsorship, but that ended, and then they refused to renew it, any sponsorship. What, what was weird is they did, did, they did not notify us that they would not renew the sponsorship. So I was just collecting the various costs and discovered that we had to pay invoices on the Rackspace account since months like because yeah um, i review all our account every two three months to see how we stand with the cost and so yeah the notification 
but yeah, anyway, so one account um, less in the project. Any other topic that you want to bring? Mark, sounds like. So the Azure dangling VM, that was, I assume, a cost, a cost management thing. And I wonder if, if systematically checking for high costs may be something we want to consider. Uh, so in that case, it was low cost. It was less oh. than 20 bucks. But these oh. machines were just standing there with name or a function that were clear that it was not used anymore. Okay. Um, and uh, same on AWS uh, based on cost. I'm currently preparing something for the next uh, next weekly about um, uh, breaking down the cost on AWS now between the kind of instances on CI Jenkins IO. Is it a cost that come from the AKS workload from IMEM from low, low memory? And at the end of the month, we should see improvement on that area. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, last call, last topic. We're six, seven minutes before the end of the meeting. So that's, that's awesome. Thanks for your time and have a great weekend. Goodbye.